Case at 12. The Nightbeat starts right now. A new on the Nightbeat 2 videos released tonight showing deadly encounters with San Antonio police. The videos are the first to be released since the department implemented its police policy on releasing body camera footage. Back in December, SAPD announced it would release portions of body cam videos and 911 calls in certain instances. When a San Antonio police officer shoots someone or uses force that results in a person's death. The video would also be released within 60 days of the incident as long as the police chief gives his approval. If he chooses not to, the policy states he should tell the public the reasons why. The videos released today are edited and produced by the police department and narrated by an officer. They do not show the entire incident. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. They also make it clear the videos they are showing are what they the San Antonio Police Department believes is relevant to the shootings. We're going to start off with a traffic stop that escalated into the fatal shooting of two men. Tonight, the family of one of those men disputing what was released tonight. And we do want to warn you, these videos are difficult to watch. The heavily produced video released by SAPD starts with an introduction from their public affairs manager. This critical incident video release is intended to provide you with information as the department currently understands it. Then a San Antonio police officer narrates what's happening in the body cam video. The car was occupied by two men and one woman. This was the traffic stop on April 16th on Pin Road near Highway 90. The encounter starts off calmly. The driver is Sammy Barbosa. His family says he was pulled over for not turning on his blinker. The police officer asks him to turn off the car and place the keys somewhere that he can see them. I'm not going to do that for you. Okay, I'm going to get the keys. If you ain't going to take off, I'm just going to put them up here just so you don't take off. It's for my safety. Look, I'm not. Okay, you going to put them up there? Yeah, yeah there you go. Bro. The officer asks Barbosa to step out of the car because he smells marijuana. I, I did smoke. I did smoke earlier, and it, it, but it's the smell of me. Okay, I'm cool. being honest with you. In the edited video, police say the passenger asked the backseat passenger for a gun. The police officer tells Barbosa to step out of the truck. What? 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 Sir, please. The passenger with the gun shoots the officer's finger. The officer retreats behind his patrol unit to get his gun that's now on the ground. He returns fire, hitting Barbosa, the front seat passenger, and a third passenger in the back seat. In the edited video, the police officer says that the officer on the scene feared for his life. This is a second angle of the shooting. This is dash cam video from the officer's patrol unit. You see the officer grabbing his gun from his holster as the front Sir. seat passenger, Alex Garcia, fires a gun, hitting the officer first. Tonight, Barbosa's family says these heavily edited and narrated videos don't show the entire story. Barbosa's sister, father, and mother saw the unedited versions earlier this week. Barbosa's nephew spoke on behalf of the family. He said the unedited version shows Barbosa complied with the officer's demands the entire time and kept his hands where the officer could see them. The version that was released to the public today was a very edited and scripted a video that I feel like portrays a, a certain justifiable as like killing somebody. I don't understand why the police officer would shoot first at the driver knowing that he was compliant and didn't have any weapons then shoot at the person second who's firing at him. Sammy Barbosa was a father of four. His youngest, just four years old. He was killed the day before his other son's sixth birthday. His family, says Barbosa, would never shoot a police officer. Taught me everything that I know today and just becoming the person who I am, which is being honest and kind and always putting your family first no matter what. Barbosa's family says he was on the way to H-E-B to pay a utility bill. They say the passengers were his friends at one time, but had been fighting over the past month before the shooting and sent Barbosa threatening messages. The family says when they found out he was killed along Penn Road, he was nowhere near the H-E-B he normally visits. They believe Barbosa was being held hostage and that his passengers planned on killing him that day. They say the unedited video shows a nervous Barbosa, which they believe shows that he was in danger. 
After that shooting, the front seat passenger died. The back seat passenger survived. The San Antonio Police Department says investigations into deadly force can take more than a year and point out their understanding of what happened could change as the investigation continues. Another video was also released tonight showing the gunman who fired shots at the San Antonio Interna International Airport back in April. In this case, only narrated portions of surveillance video were released, saying the park police officer involved was unable to activate his body worn camera due to the situation. The angles of video provided show the gunman Joe Gomez fire towards people and vehicles, and you can see people scramble. That suspect wounded by a park police officer before Gomez turned the gun on himself. A portion of 911 audio from that shooting was also released. San Antonio 911, this is Jessica. Do you need police, fire, or EMS? Hi, there's um, a police um, shooting at the airport. They're at the airport, there's someone shooting. Now, while the San Antonio Police Department has said that they will release relevant elements of these shootings, those in the department are the ones deciding what is relevant. A piece of audio the defenders showed you a day after that shooting at the airport was not released today. The piece of audio from that day and internal records show officers were forced to assign themselves to the shooting call at the airport after a dispatcher said she didn't know how to handle the situation. Communications, Holly. Holly, I don't know how to handle this. I've never done this before. Is this north? Yes. Okay, let me get down there one second. Hold on. Okay. Thank you. All right. I'll move it. Bye. Records show a supervisor intervened and was able to correct the issue. They also showed the dispatcher was given an employee discussion worksheet after the airport incident. In both of these videos, we could see what could be termed as heroic actions by the police officers. That is not the problem here. Releasing highly edited and produced versions of body cam and surveillance footage is. Picking and choosing what they release is not what transparency looks like from the San Antonio Police Department. New tonight, the defenders uncovering new information surrounding the deadly February storms. Two weeks before that storm, CPS Energy was being hounded by its weather information provider. The issue, unpaid bills that were months overdue. The night team's Dylan Collier ex examines the timing of these disconcerting debts in tonight's defenders report. These homemade shrines remind Nieves Barrientos' family of happier times. She will like helping others. Despite having a place to sleep at her daughter Avilia Aguilar's home, the 64-year-old grandmother decided to instead wait out winter storm Yuri at her own house, less than a mile away. The weather was horrible. We were going to take my mom some food because um, I'll be the one taking her everything. Sadly, Barrientos became one of San Antonio's first official victims of the winter blast. Her body discovered by a family member February 16th on the kitchen floor of a Southside residence that was without power and had become so cold inside, her family had trouble feeling their hands and feet. Barrientos, according to her autopsy, was wearing five layers of clothing on her upper body at the time of her death her stomach and lower body covered in rashes, possibly related to exposure to the cold. The top of the list for her causes of death, hypothermia. But why if she was fine, she was good last night. While Barrientos' family was making arrangements to bury her, CPS Energy's meteorologist data coordinator, the one who calls himself Kid Coldfront on social media, was taking a break from forecasting the weather to send a picture to a CPS staffer of himself on board a so-called snow mower, an apparent attempt at levity while the bodies of people who froze to death were still being found. After we asked the utility for all storm-related communication, Kid Coldfront's snow mower pick wasn't the only thing we uncovered. Two weeks before the deadly winter blast arrived in San Antonio, CPS Energy had fallen badly behind in payments to its weather platform provider. This February 1st email from DTN's billing department was direct. The utility owed a balance of nearly $8,900 that was now seriously past due and that its customized weather services may be disrupted if DTN didn't receive payment within 15 days. The invoice issues, according to internal records, had been going on for months, stretching back to last year. CPS Energy officials did not respond to repeated requests for comment about the billing blunders sent by us over several weeks. DTN officials late last month 
finally confirmed that they had not been forced to turn out the lights on the utility's weather and graphics system. For Aguilar and her family, continued reflection on the life of a loved one taken from them by the elements inside her own home. She got through so much and we never thought this was going to take her. For the Defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. Barrientos is one of two people at San Antonio whose deaths during February storm were officially hypothermia related. The actual death count is likely higher. To a night beat update now on that stabbing at the Palladium movie theater at the rim. Police say they identified one of the persons of interest and have cleared him from the investigation, confirming he was not involved in that stabbing. But there is still one more person that investigators are looking for tonight. Officers still want to talk to this man in the blue shirt and blue jeans. Here are two angles of the person of interest from surveillance videos. This investigation began after a woman was stabbed multiple times at the Palladium Saturday night. If you can help identify this man, call detectives at 210-207-7635. We have learned the name of a man arrested in connection with an apartment fire that displaced at least 20 people. Bren Garza is now charged with arson of a habitation. According to arrest records, Garza lived at the Bricks Terrell Hills apartments off Harry Wurzbach Road. A fire started there around four this morning. You can see flames could be seen shooting from the roof and part of that roof then collapsed. The Red Cross now helping families displaced by this fire as this investigation continues. It's still ahead on the night beat. It is the buzz around town. The rain may have left, but the mosquitoes soon followed and they're staying. We're going to take a look at the issue and what the city says you can do to help next on the night beat. That familiar buzz is back again. If you thought the February freeze might have helped hold off the mosquitoes, think again. They are alive and well. The night team's Patty Santos tells us the city and the county need your help controlling the population. At the end of mine, there's a hole right there. So that's like a pool, a nesting pool for those mosquitoes. Eastside homeowner Jessica Evans says potholes next to her home. But this is Camp Zero right here. And the tall grass on the nearby Greenway are a breeding ground for those hateful pesky mosquitoes. You can see them flying in, you know, in groups. And they're not the little teeny weeny ones, they're the ones with the big legs. Similar problems are plaguing neighborhoods across the city and county. Definitely the freeze did not kill them off. They're very resilient. The recent rain has left plenty of breeding pools for them to make a vengeful comeback. We've ha got an influx of, of calls. The city and county mosquito control programs are busy setting out traps to track the mosquito population and any diseases they carry, as well as spraying or fogging public areas is in the evening. It's really up to all the individual residents to take the steps to clear any standing water from around from their property from around their house and really contribute to preventing the, the spread of mosquitoes. Even a small amount in a bottle cap can be a thriving place for them. Clean out gutters and keep the grass short. There are more than 80 different types of mosquitoes in Texas. Mosquito season is from March till about October. With our climate here, really mosquitoes never really go away. And they're everyone's problem. There's a trail and we went through there this morning and they're lively down there. Patty Santos. They're real lively down there. Yeah. KSAT 12 News. If you live in San Antonio and have a mosquito problem that you'd like the city to try to address, call 311. If you're out of the county, call the Public Works Service Center in your area. We have all of that information listed on our website at ksat.com. And Adam Kasky has a very different thought on mosquitoes. I just, you know, I, I'm... <laughs> not a fan of them whenever nope. they come out and how they come out. I think it's a good problem to have. It's a sign that we had some good soaking rainfall and that we've made some changes and we finally have some standing water out there in spots. And of course, it's a side effect of rain. We see a lot of that, but we would have mosquitoes anyway. It's just the rain definitely made the situation worse. And really, the only way to completely eradicate them would be a frost or a freeze right now. We all know that's not going to happen. All right, let's talk about our drought. This is six weeks ago. We got the newest drought monitor in. I like to give you the comparison. Six weeks ago, a lot of red on the map. We don't like the red. That's extreme and exceptional drought. Not good for 
mosquitoes and their larva. However, look at this today. Yes, pretty much all the drought has been completely erased and wiped off the map because of our rainfall over the past couple of months. There is a portion of Texas, West Texas, and even some of the Western Panhandle where we still really need the rainfall, particularly about five counties in far West Texas, Marathon area, Alpine, Marfa, even stretching down toward Big Bend National Park. Beautiful area, beautiful part of Texas, but unfortunately they really need the rainfall. They haven't benefited from that soggy pattern that we had. Our aquifer, oh, it benefited. Okay, so look at it since January 1st. We had our February freeze and all the issues, big drop, rebounded, then pumping season with no rain. March on into April began, and you saw that big drop off into stage two restrictions. Then look, all it took was that heavy rain and that nice soggy pattern, and it really spiked, and now no watering restrictions other than the typical year-round watering rules. I'm not done talking water yet. I'm really into it tonight. Medina Lake still three feet lower than it was three months ago. So Medina Lake really didn't rebound from the rainfall. That reservoir has a very small watershed. Heavy rain has to fall in a specific spot right over the lake or right up into Bandera County. That's its water watershed. That's it. So it's actually a little bit lower. Canyon usually more stable water level. It's up three feet over the past three months. Choke up seven feet. Corpus, Lake Corpus Christi, that reservoir up about six feet, but still just two feet below the conservation pool. So quiet in our skies today. For the second day in a row, we had a few isolated thunderstorms in West Texas where they really need the rainfall. Upper level high still dominating. This is going to push northward as we get into the weekend. So by next week, we'll have a northerly flow and that's going to open the door for some disturbances. Should there be any, they could move into town and trigger a few isolated thunderstorms. We're also watching just for basically long term the potential for a little development in the southern Gulf of Mexico. A lot of moisture down there. There could be some of that and some energy moving our way. Once that upper high moves out, it could open the door for some moisture coming in off the Gulf. That would be beyond a week from now. So next week, starting Monday, basically every afternoon, an isolated thunder shower or two. Beyond that, we could see some more moisture from the Gulf. We'll keep you updated. 75 this morning, 90 again for the high temperature. I think that's the fourth day in a row right at 90 degrees. Right now we're at 82 Del Rio 91 still 82 in Uvalde and some upper 70s in the hill country. It's sticky outside. That's the key. Very muggy. This humidity. It's not going to change like the mosquitoes. <laughs> it's, it's going to remain intact. So tomorrow we start the day at 75 top out at 93. Very similar to today, just a couple of degrees warmer, low morning clouds giving way to afternoon sunshine along the Rio Grande. We're thinking triple digits, Del Rio, Eagle Pass, Camado, even Carrizo Springs and Catula at the century mark. And keep in mind, it's going to feel like it's about seven to 10 degrees warmer than the air temperature. This weekend, mid 90s and sunny next week. Similar temperatures, just those slight rain chances every day. All right, thank you, Adam. All right, the Cowboys still in training. Or are they? As far as their mini camp, it is over because things have gone so well. They only did two out of the three days. Next up, of course, is training camp, and that means it's a transition at center, a new starting center. When we come back, we'll talk about that. And what are the odds Becky Hammond is a head coach in the NBA this offseason? We got them for you coming up. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys head coach Mike McCarthy canceled the final day of the mandatory mini camp and turned it into what the team is calling a group dynamic event. Since he is satisfied with the work that has been done in the organized team activities in the first two days of mini camp, as a result, Tyler Biotish goes into the Cowboys training camp next month as a starting center after getting a taste of what that would be like last season, getting four stars playing behind Joe Looney following the retirement of Travis Frederick. Looney is still a free agent, while Biotish has shown dramatic improvement from his first season in the NFL. The Cowboys drafted him in the fourth round in 2020. While he struggled in pass protection, he excelled in run blocking. Now he gets some work alongside both Tyron Smith, who missed all but two games after having neck surgery, and Lael Collins, who missed all of last season following hip surgery, to go along with Zach Collins and Connor Williams on the Cowboys' offensive line. I've been talking to Tyron a lot during practice um, on some stuff, and he's been a great mentor. Um, you know, I talked to Tyron and uh, Zach uh, quite a bit, um, even though they're they're not doing a lot of OTA stuff with us. Uh, I still talk to them a lot um, and get some tips and everything. And it means means a lot to me, especially with their experience. And um, yeah, they're great leaders, and you know I like to be one of them. 
Tony Pollard is about to enter his third year in the NFL, coming off his best season so far, participating in all 16 games last year, actually starting two with four touchdowns and no fumbles. Now, during this offseason, the Cowboys running back has even worked out at wide receiver to showcase his versatility, but he also worked out with Ezekiel Elliott, as described as locked in, who has his body right. That's after a career low four yards per carry, fumbling five times. Pollard was asked, what is motivating Zeke to be in the best shape of his career, playoffs, rushing title, or more? Just being hungry, I mean, our whole goal here is to, to win it all. Like, no matter how far we get, you know, we, we want to win it all. That's everybody's goal coming into the season. And if you're not doing that, you're falling short. So that means that it's room for improvement all around. Dallas Cowboys has signed second-round draft pick Kelvin Joseph to his rookie four-year contract. The Cowboys made him the 44th overall pick in 2021 draft, and there are those who believe he can immediately start at cornerback. Joseph last played at Kentucky after he transferred from LSU, where he played 11 games as a true freshman. That's after he sat out 2019 due to NCAA regulations. If Joseph is going to be a starter, he's going to have to shine in both training camp and preseason after missing minicamp due to the COVID quarantine. While Dallas Cowboys are wrapping up their mandatory minicamp today, the Houston Texans have decided to cancel their minicamp that would start set to start next Tuesday. New head coach David Culley claiming that the offseason work that needed to be done has been done with full participation in the organized team activities, albeit without star quarterback Deshaun Watson, who now will not be fine for missing the mandatory event. So what will the players do with the unexpected time off? There's no time off. Uh, I, I pretty much, uh, like I said, I relax a little bit, um, but I, I'm still going to get my workouts in every day. Um, just to make sure I stay ahead of the game because, you know, uh, COVID last year just messed everything up to where I didn't work out until pretty much I got to camp pretty much. So um, now I have a full season of working out. I feel better. I feel stronger, faster, um, more smart, more comfortable and everything. So, like I said, we're, I think everybody feels that way a little bit. Having a, a whole year under your belt, especially speaking for rookies, is so um, for us to just have a whole year of working out, now we can be able to go play and show what we really can do. All right, the College Football Playoff Management Committee will consider expanding to a 12-team format when it meets in Chicago next week. The proposal, as reported by ESPN, calls for the bracket to include the six highest-ranked conference champions and the six remaining highest-ranked teams determined by the CFP Selection Committee. Under the 12-team proposal, the four highest-ranked conference champions would be ranked 1-4 to four and receive a first-round bye, with 5-12 through 12 would play each other on the home field of the higher-ranked team, with the quarterfinals and semifinals featured in bowl games and the championship at a neutral site. What are the odds Becky Hammond is a head coach this offseason? Next. What are the odds that Becky Hammond becomes a head coach this offseason? Pretty good if you listen to sports betting. According to that website, Becky is listed as 6-1 to to become the new head coach of the Indiana Pacers, who just fired Nate Bjorkren after just one season. Not bad, even though she's behind Terry Stotts, who was fired after nine seasons in Portland. Hammond, who also has been a Spurs assistant coach since 2014, is also listed as a 7-1 to odds to land the Orlando vacancy, which is fifth overall. Good luck with the Smithson Valley Rangers, who will be facing Rockwall Heath in the Class 6A state semifinals tomorrow. Dell Diamond and Round Rock, the Rangers' first trip to state since 2005. That's after they beat Los Fresos in a single elimination game over two days due to weather, 3-2 to two to win the Region 4 Finals. We have faced everything. You know, we face changing locations, lightning delays you know, after every week. You know, we played, you know, unbelievable atmospheres. You know, we, we are ready for this. We have to relish every moment that we get because, I mean, now it's our last week. So, I mean, we got to take everything in like it's the last thing that we're going to do because it is batter up tomorrow night in round rock we'll be at 7 p.m we're hoping we're starting a two game event up yeah, in round rock absolutely <laughs> got it thanks greg we'll be right back Tomorrow morning, widespread mid 70s in the morning, a little closer to 80 degrees at sunrise in Del Rio. And then we get into the afternoon hours and we're looking at highs along the Rio Grande about 100 right at the century mark. It's looking and feeling like summertime here in South and Central Texas. Leon Springs 93, Bernie 91, Seguin 93 the high in Castorville. About mid 90s, about 95 the high temperature. And this weekend we're looking at some mid 90s as well. Good amount of sunshine next week. Just a slight modification. Some daily pop up afternoon showers. Nothing severe. We're just anticipating some of those pop up afternoon garden variety showers. All right, thanks, Adam. GMSA at 4.30 in the morning. Have a great night.